I'm your Coffee with Closers podcast host, Steve Burke. Earlier this year, we were fortunate to interview Holocaust historian, curator, and American Jewish University professor, Dr. Michael Berenbaum. He joined us to preview the opening of Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away, the world-renowned traveling exhibition, which is currently at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California. In light of the recent atrocities in Israel, we've decided to re-air the episode. Dr. Berenbaum sheds light on the significance of educating people of all ages about one of humanity's darkest chapters and the profound lessons it holds for our present times. Due to overwhelming demand, Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away, has been extended through January 28th, 2024 at the Reagan Library. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Welcome to Coffee with Closers, a podcast produced by Pinkston, a strategic communications firm headquartered just outside Washington, D.C. We talk with some of America's most influential closers, from industry-leading CEOs to best-selling authors, professional athletes, entrepreneurs, and everyone in between. So grab a cup of coffee and sit back as we take you on an informative, thought-provoking, and highly entertaining journey into the lives of highly successful, driven, forward-thinking disruptors who are making a lasting impact in their field and on society. Joining us today is Dr. Michael Berenbaum, an author, lecturer, rabbi, and Holocaust historian. Dr. Berenbaum is the director of the Ziegy Zering Institute at American Jewish University and the curator of the special exhibition, Auschwitz, Not Long Ago, Not Far Away, opening at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California, on March 21st. Uh, Dr. Barenbaum, welcome to Coffee with Closers. How are you doing today? Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Great. So on March 24th, Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away, the traveling exhibit opens at the uh, Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California, making its West Coast premiere. Um, tell us at a high level about uh, this exhibit, what it is, and also tell us um, why the exhibit is, has been described and, quote, a story to shake the conscience of the world. Let's begin with a very basic thing. The first word in the title of the exhibition is Auschwitz. Auschwitz, as it were, is the capital of evil. It is evil personified. In reality, the Auschwitz camp was three camps. The first was a concentration camp, German concentration camp for Polish uh, political prisoners. The second was an industrial complex known as Bunamanowicz in which um, German industry, not the Nazis, but German industry, invested 700 million 1942 rights marks, about $400 million in 1942, to build an industrial complex that presumed that slave labor would be a permanent part of the German war economy. The third part of Auschwitz is the death camp called Birkenau, or Auschwitz II. And it's the place in which 1.1 million people were killed, most of them upon arrival. And it's probably the most infamous of all the death camps and also becomes symbolic of the Holocaust as a whole. We, um, on the exhibition, had a unique opportunity, and that is that uh, 2 million people come a year to Auschwitz, the death camp. But many people can't visit Poland, and they gave us the opportunity. If you can't visit Auschwitz, we can bring Auschwitz, the experience, to you. What does that mean? It's been in, um, it opened in Madrid. It's been in Malmo, Sweden. It's been in New York City. It's been in Kansas City, and now it's coming out to Simi Valley. And we have 700 different artifacts material of the perpetrator and of the victim that gives life to a story. 
And what we tell is we tell the story of the creation of Auschwitz, of the people who were murdered in Auschwitz, of the staff who did the murdering of the evil, and also the process by which the murders took place. Because this is an industrialized killing. It's the equivalent of the combination of Henry Ford's, um, you know, assembly line factory of death with Charles Darwin's survival of the fittest. So we are able to bring all of this material to the public. And we've had enormous success in every city that we've been in. Success means that people come. Success is that people regard it as a powerful and morally significant experience. Morally significant because you confront evil. You also confront several other things. You confront courage. You confront resilience. You confront human suffering. And you also confront resistance, which has been given a, a different name in our era, where we see the power of resistance taking place almost on a daily basis in Ukraine. Let me ask you this. Thank you, Doctor. Um, as a curator of this exhibit, um, how did the project come together? Um, how were you able to gather all of the artifacts and objects uh, f for this exhibit, getting it uh, up and running uh, and on the road? Uh, obviously, there's got to be a tremendous uh, logistical responsibilities that go with this. Uh, talk to us about how the, how the concept came to be and, and uh, how it all started. It came to be in the mind of the owner of the Spanish Special Exhibition Corporation, Lurie Ferraro. Mm -hmm. Louis lost his brother as a young man. And he found that one of the most compelling books that spoke to his soul was Viktor Frankl's book, uh, Essentially Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl describes his experience in Tresenstadt and his experience in Auschwitz. And he then came up with the idea that I have to go to Auschwitz to see it. When he went to Auschwitz, he then said, we now, I, I'm in the special exhibitions business, he said to himself. We have to see if it's possible to convince Auschwitz to cooperate with us and we'll create a special exhibition to bring Auschwitz to the people. He then turned to my colleague, Robert Jan van Pelt. Robert Jan van Pelt is an architectural historian and is um, a man who, I would say, um, uh, I'm going to put it in a, in a semi-boastful fashion. Uh, I've written um, and edited an 800 a page book on Auschwitz with 400 pages of footnotes. And I concede that Robert Jan van Pelt knows more than I do about Auschwitz, but I know more about creating museums. So we created a team, Robert Jan van Pelt, myself with an educator called Paul Sammons and a designer with Louis as the chief of the team. And we began to say, what story do we want to tell about Auschwitz? because we believe firmly that a museum is a storytelling institution. Now think of a museum to understand what a story and story, as you know, given your business story is one of those powerful means of communication. The Bible is a story. The gospels, which have brought faith to so many are essentially stories. And in our day, we have two great modalities of story. We have film and we have museums. Film, if you think of it as moving imagery in a captive audience, a museum has captive imagery and a moving audience. So we take the principles of storytelling and we apply them knowing that we want the audience to move along with the story because it finds the story fascinating. We begin with um, a very powerful exhibition that shows the industrial nature of it, a whole range of railroad cars and railroad, railroad tracks and, and, and 
railroad wheels. And also we begin with one artifact of a child, which is a shoe. Behind it are thousands and tens of thousands of shoes, pictures of those, but that the, the railroad wheels present the industrialized nature of the operation. And the shoe, if you think of a little girl's shoe, that's a shoe that she wore to a dance. It's a shoe that she wore to school. It presents the victim in a very powerful way. And then we tell the story of both Auschwitz and the town, which is not Auschwitz. Auschwitz was the German name. The town was Auschwitz. And we take you through the evolution of the process by which Auschwitz became Auschwitz. We introduce you to the killers. We introduce you to the process. We see the instrumentalities by which they created, um, their death. And then we also introduce you throughout to the victims. So their voices are heard and their story becomes heard, becomes understood. You spoke at the, um, the, Ra the Reagan presidential library when they were bringing the, uh, the train car in. Um, and you, you talked about why that was a significant part of the exhibit. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what, what that meant? That uh, certainly I can, I can talk about it. Let me just put it to you very briefly. Yeah. There, there were two stages of killing. The first stage is that mobile killers were sent to stationary victims. They went to town after town, village and hamlet. They rounded up Jews, they rounded up Soviet commissars, and they rounded up what are called Roman Sinti, or commonly and pejoratively known as gypsies. They marched them out of the town to the edge of the town, to a valley, to a cliff, to a wadi, and they shot them one by one by one, person by person by person, men, women, and children, village by village, town by town city by city. They didn't operate alone. They got cooperation from anti-Semites, from gendarmerie. They got cooperation from militant groups in various areas of the Soviet Union. So for example, in Lithuania, the murders were done, two out of three were done by Lithuanians. In Estonia, all the Jews were killed by Estonians in order to inherit their property. That became difficult for the killers. They needed to drink. They drank afterwards, and then they started drinking before and sometimes even during. So the Nazis came up with a brilliant idea. Let's reverse the process. And if they reverse the process, you make the victims mobile and you make the killing centers stationary. So it depersonalized the killing. It made it more impactful. It made it more uh, like automation, as it were. And they developed the notion of death camp where killing was by gas. Cremation almost always followed. And consequently, and Auschwitz itself has a very unique thing. Auschwitz has 44 parallel railroad tracks. Now, years ago, I helped develop, I was in charge of the development of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And this is for your listening audience. This is before internet. So how do you find out what a parallel railroad track means? I called Amtrak and in those days you could get somebody on the phone. Unbelievable. You didn't have to go <laughs> through, you know, the good old the, days. The, the, the phone tag, you get somebody on the phone and I asked him a question. I said, how many parallel railroad tracks does Penn Station have? And then I was floored when he said 21. Wow. I then asked how many parallel, what's the largest number of parallel railroad tracks that we have in the United States? And he answered 49 in the Chicago stockades. All of a sudden, I began to understand why Auschwitz was, became Auschwitz, because railroad tracks connected it from the four corners of Europe 
and you could funnel population right into Auschwitz. And that's the reason Auschwitz was selected at it. So the other part of the railroad track that's very important is that was the last moment that families were together. Think of yourself. It's the last moment you would be with your wife, with your children. If you lived near your parents, with your parents, with sometimes cousins and relatives, friends and family. And that would be the last moment that was taking you from a ghetto or from your own to your death. And then beyond that, upon arrival, you had separation, women to one side, men to the other, women with children, one to one side, they lined up five by five, and then they faced selection. Selection was where a German physician, and these were always physicians, looked at you in a tenth of a second and said, capable of work or not capable of work, right or left. If you were capable of work and they needed workers that day, then you were sent to be branded and sheared. Your hair was shaved. You were deloused. You were uh, given a uniform without any size and you lost your hair uh, and you got branded. You had your number put on your arm. But 80%, sometimes, sometimes even 90%, went directly not to the camp itself, but to the gas chamber. And we have in this, uh, a depiction of the gas chamber, which gives you two very specific and very powerful details. The first is a drawing done by a Zunder commando, a prisoner who worked in the vicinity of the gas chambers, who shows the deception that was involved because he shows that the gas to kill the Jews arrived in a Red Cross truck. Not a real Red Cross truck, but a truck that was painted with a Red Cross. Why a Red Cross? Because whenever we see the Red Cross, we believe that we're in a place of safety, a place of compassion, a place where human dignity is going to be preserved a place that's designed to help you. Red Cross normally means what? Rescue. And here it became the instrumentality of death. Robert Jan van Pelt, my distinguished colleague, is an architectural historian, so he paid attention to one very specific element of Auschwitz uh, Birkenau, of the gas chamber, which is the gas chamber had pillars that were double cages. Now he looked into that and he asked why double cages, because in one sense, crematoria two and three were misdesigned. They made the opening for gas on the top, but you and I know that gas rises and consequently the opening for the gas should be what? At the bottom of the gas chamber, not at the top. They solved the problem with this double cage because they could lower the gas down in a basket, hold it there for 30 minutes, and then they could lift it up and have the gas evaporate into the air. And this gave them the opportunity to reuse the gas chamber not once every 24 hours, but once every hour and a half or two hours, which meant that they could quadruple, they could actually do 12 times the number of gassings that they could otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that's the way in which they operated. And we even have a receipt there, which shows you that the cost of gassing ended up being when you had 2000 people in the gas chamber and that ended up being about one half of one cent per person. That's and that. And, and, you know, we say the devil's in the sales. When you go through Auschwitz and you um, see this, you begin to understand the magnitude of it and the depth of it and the depravity of evil. And remember, these were not 
the, the other thing we, we try to show is that there were multiple killers. The gas chambers were built and designed by architects. The gas was created by chemists. The crematoria had the sign on it of the company that created J. Tuff and Company. So these were professional, uh, almost all men. So let's say professional men being gender specific who were doing this job, not at Auschwitz, but in their home office, in their offices back at their companies and bidding for these contracts and never saying, look what's happening. What am I doing? Now, every town, every city has crematoria. But the important element of crematoria is that the crematoria have to gather the ashes. If you're cremating a relative, what do you want at the end of the cremation? You want to receive that person's ashes, his or her ashes. When you design a crematoria for mass murder, you're already seeing what's happening because nobody's collecting the ashes. And consequently, we show the professionalism of the killing process. But we also show some of the particular elements of the victim that tell their story and give us a feel as to who they were. And we hear from the survivors. Throughout the exhibition, we hear from survivors who tell their story and who were the eyewitnesses to the event. I understand that great care was taken to ensure that the respect of the, the victims uh, and their families and the visitors uh, were maintained. Um, how, how big of a challenge was that? Um, uh, what, what, what went into those, obviously what went into those, uh, that, that, that decision, how, how did you come, how was that maintained? That's a terrific question. Important question. Let me share with you and our audience, the problem. The problem is that you have to depict dehumanization. Mm -hmm. Auschwitz is about dehumanizing people. People were treated as vermin. They were quotation marks exterminated. If you don't depict the degradation of human beings, you're not depicting Auschwitz. But how do you depict dehumanization without re-dehumanizing? In other words, how do you show that without once again treating the victim as a commodity, as an non-entity? And that involves hundreds of small decisions as to how you portray a picture, as to how you represent it, as to the way in which, for example, um, you occasionally may present nudity without sexuality because anybody who thinks of it in sexual terms is, is, is misleading, but the nudity becomes what the nudity becomes, um, um, a way again of degrading people. Um, and we tried to also show the type of what we would call spiritual resistance or symbolic resistance that allowed people to remain human in a situation that was designed to destroy their humanity. Mm -hmm. One of the great writers on Auschwitz, um, has a chapter in his book called, if this be a man, it's Primo Levi in America. It's, it, it, the Italian book is if this be a man, the American book is called survival in Auschwitz. It misrepresents the title in Italian, but he said, here, there is no why. Now here there is no why means for the, and you have to understand that part of the way we orient ourselves to the world is because we believe the world makes sense. Now, if everything is arbitrary, there's no way in which you can order yourself. You can create order out of chaos. Um, and it's, it, it's another way of violating the human being because Essentially, there's no way to figure out a strategy for survival. There's no way to figure out a way of preserving uh, your dignity in a total assault. So part of 
what makes Auschwitz, again, the exhibition and the event of Auschwitz so important is because it's a thorough and complete and total assault on human dignity by other human beings. Hmm. And therefore we, let, let me give you another example. We sometimes create, um, there were a couple of pictures taken as acts of resistance in the camp. The last thing the Nazis wanted was for what really happened at Auschwitz to come out. So for example, even how you frame a photograph, we show that some photographs were taken from inside a window by showing that the photograph is not a perfect photograph. It's not an artistic photograph. It's not a beautiful photograph. It's a clandestine attempt to document what was happening. And we crop the photograph in such a way that you, you feel like you're on the inside looking at this and trying to document it. So the visitor is put in the same circumstances as the person who took the photograph who was resisting by documenting it for history. Got it. In terms of doctor, in, um, in terms of the visitors coming to see this exhibit, um, why is it important for school groups, young adults, um, to come, to come experience, uh, this exhibit? You know, um, I'm going to answer you in a paradoxical way. I'm going to say, I wish it wasn't important. Yeah. My dream is that what I study becomes irrelevant. Right. Because 21st century humanity could not behave like that. But that's not the world you and I inhabit. Why is it important? Because it's important that we confront evil. It's important that we confront um, the issues raised by Auschwitz. It's important that we understand the preciousness and the precariousness of democracy that we understand some of the basic elements of American society that protect us from this evil. It's important that we remember the essential creed of the United States that all persons are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And once you have that, then you understand that some of this could not happen if we remain faithful to America and if we remain faithful to the notion that human dignity is consecrated in the American experience. It's not only human freedom, right. it's human, it's human dignity that's consecrated in the American experience. It's and I wish, I, I wish we didn't have to say this. I wish that this were communicated. But part of what we're trying to do is to face evil, not to look at the darkness, but to get the, not only to look at the darkness, but to get the determination to light a candle, to alleviate the darkness, to alleviate suffering and to create circumstances in which events like this, similar to this cannot happen at least not with our acquiescence, at least not with our silence. And we're also trying to teach people that they have to become upstanders, which is they have to not become bystanders, not become perpetrators, but upstanders who are willing to stand up and confront evil when they see it in ways large and small. The title of the exhibit is Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away. Um, tell us, um, and this is probably a related question as a follow-up, but how did you come to use that phrase and what does it mean? We did something, um, first of all, let's begin with the phrase. The phrase is a scandal. Auschwitz should be long gone far away. It should not have echoes in the world in which we live. Yep. 
but unfortunately it has echoes in the world. It has echoes and reverberation in the world in which we live. Uh, so the title itself is a provocative scandal. But the other part of it is we're going against the view of certain people who, when they treated the Holocaust, they said that world's not our world. Even as great a man as Elie Wiesel, who uh, I, I wrote a book on him, he's a, an unbelievably influential uh, writer with regard to and, and teacher with regard to the Holocaust. He said, that world is not our world. It's the kingdom of night. We deliberately said, that's not true. It's an expression in the extreme without restraint of the world in which we live. And you had better look at that and experience that and see that in order to create a better world for yourself and for your children today. So I wish Auschwitz was long ago and far away. I wish we could say that's not our world, but I hear echoes of that in the world in which we live. And remember, there's a paradox of the Holocaust itself. And the paradox of the Holocaust itself is that the more distant we stand from the event, the larger the event looms. That interest has increased dramatically over the decades in the Holocaust, precisely because we intuit that it has something important to say to our world. Surveys show that Americans know very little about the Holocaust, and that is true of both adults and younger Americans. Um, how much does this concern you and what more needs to be done to educate people about one of the greatest crimes and darkest chapters in all of humanity. Uh, I'm um, one of those who doesn't quite believe the surveys. Oh, interesting. Uh, and the reason I don't believe the surveys is because I don't believe that unless people presumes that they know something about the Holocaust, mm -hmm. that the misuse of the Holocaust, the misuse and the abuse, the, 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 all of that, um, would work. Uh, I take, you know, uh, let me digress for a moment. When I train people about how to create museums, I say there are three levels of museum visitors. The skimmer, the swimmer, the deep diver. The skimmer is the equivalent of how do you communicate something at 60 miles an hour for seven seconds, which is what a billboard does. Right. But, but billboards work. Right. Billboards tell you something important that you are unimportant that you want to do. So I can't believe that, for example, and I, I, I don't want to touch on politics, but I'm going to touch on politics that people who abused it by comparing mass to the yellow star understood the yellow star was a symbol of evil. They knew something about it. And when they searched to, how do I say the mask is awful, terrible, miserable, they ended up reverting to yellow stars. Now that's a misuse because the yellow star Mark choose for destruction and the mask was a means of both protecting yourself and possibly protecting others. So the analogy doesn't work, but apparently enough people even to abuse it understood the yellow star. Um, let's take a, 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 so when they compare it to Nazis and the like, they, they understand that somehow this has been the most extreme case of evil. And that's why it's almost irresistible to go into those comparisons. Holocaust education, we want to see Holocaust education in the schools. What this exhibition does is it's public education. It's what we call public history. And remember, uh, somebody asked me, why is it fitting that it be at the Ronald Reagan Library? Well, there's something very interesting. Uh, there are two things that are very interesting about 
Reagan's um, uh, experience. Number one, Ronald Reagan understood evil. If you think he understood evil, and Ronald Reagan um, made a misrepresentation that was interesting because of what it represented. He said at one event that he was um, there um, when the films were made. Ronald Reagan, as a young actor, was um, saw the raw film footage of the concentration camps not because he was in the concentration camp, but he was in the screening room. And it was so real to him that he felt that he was there. Mm, wow. And there's a, it, I mean, when, when uh, and, and he corrected it, I mean, but it became so real to him that as he ad-libbed and spoke about it, he was there. And he saw that and he experienced that. And that was, um, again, something that was quite formative. So it's very appropriate that it be at the Reagan library. And it's very appropriate that, that, um, so I would like to see more Holocaust education, but not again, only to teach about evil, but to teach all the other elements that have to, including human resilience, the effort to preserve human dignity, how one endures, how one comes back from the other, and also the model of appropriate behavior, the upstander, the Danes protected their citizens. There was a, a Huguenot village in France called Le Chambon. And the pastor of that village said every, ended every sermon, every Sunday with the following lines, thou shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul and all thy might and love thy neighbor as thyself. Go practice it. That village saved 5,000 Jewish youngsters, including people I knew, including the first librarian of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And again, it shows you what happens when people have values and maintain values and what it represents. And it also poses challenges to us, challenges for how we're going to confront evil, challenges for what is it to cooperate, to collaborate, to enable, to empower. And it poses questions to us. And questions are very important, even if they don't yield easy answers. Dr. Barrymount, thank you for joining us today. Before we go, I want to give you the last word. Is there um, anything else you'd like to share with our, our uh, audience today that I didn't bring up? I invite the audience to see this exhibition, those who are in Southern California, those of you who are in Washington, D.C., Go visit the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, but there are museums throughout the country now that present this history and it's an important history. It's one we have to remember. And let me conclude with the way in which I once concluded a museum, which is the word of a survivor. He said, I've told you this story not to weaken you, but to strengthen you. Now it's up to you. Learn this history, but really what it's designed to do is to strengthen your moral character and your moral determination because we believe an audience can do better. Thank you for having me. Well said. So Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away, opens on March 24th and runs through August 13th at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California. Tickets to this powerful and moving exhibition are on sale now and can be purchased at www.reaganlibrary.com backslash Auschwitz, www.reaganlibrary.com backslash Auschwitz. Get your tickets today before they sell out. 
Dr. Berenbaum, I want to thank you for joining us. It has been an absolute honor and pleasure uh, speaking with you. And also, I'll just plug a personal note before the beginning of the show. It's good to know that you were uh, born in Newark, New Jersey, and I grew up not far away. So it's good to have a good New Yorker, New Jersey in uh, well, conversation. Well, in, in Yiddish, they say a fellow landsman. Yeah, I love it. Good good stuff. Dr. Barabell, thank you for joining us, and uh, we wish you uh, all the best uh, now and in the future. Uh, thank you so much. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. We're the Pinkston team. And this has been Coffee with Closers. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes and follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Catch us next time. We know you're not busy.